welcome to the December 2018 edition of City Connection. It's your live call-in program where we as citizens of Grand Rapids can ask our mayor about issues important to us. Grand Rapids Mayor Roslyn Bliss live here in the studio today. We're going to cover a number of city-related topics and we'll get to your questions in the second half of the show. Uh, today we're going to also welcome to the show uh, from ICCF, Ryan Berwiss. He is president there and we're going to discuss a little bit about the expansion through several affording affordable housing projects and also a little bit about what the overall plan is here in Grand Rapids for a changing housing scene. As I said, you'll have opportunity to also uh, take part in the show in the second half of the hour and we'll provide you information on screen how to do that. You can do that by phone, email, Twitter, Facebook, all those. Um, and City Connection, we are broadcasting live. That is today, December 3rd, 2018, and we're doing that on CMC's GRTV Livewire Channel 24. With Roslyn Bliss, I'm Linda Galash, and Mayor, here we are again for another live episode of City Connection. Yeah, hello. Ha uh, happy December. Yeah, there we yeah. are already. <laughs> um, it snuck up over the weekend, and now we're in December. Yeah. So uh, busy time of year, as we were just talking about. Uh, tree lightings downtown mm -hmm. this weekend. Plenty happening. Yeah, yeah, we had the tree lighting. Uh, I had the, the menorah lighting yesterday okay. in celebration of the kickoff of Hanukkah. It was a beautiful ceremony down in the Calder. Uh, lots of pop-up shops and you know events. UICA Artist Market was on Saturday. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun time of year. There's always um, a lot of activity here in Grand Rapids, but mm -hmm. it's, um, it's fun to kind of see the seasonal changes and how it gears up in different ways. Yeah. Um, wanted to get to a few just uh, little things that we should touch on. We sure. were last year, it was uh, just before the elections, mm. the midterm elections, and now that we knew those results and we know how the things gone, what kind of yeah. things can you see that will result in some change for Grand Rapids in particular? Yeah. Yeah, what a great election. Uh, you probably noted that it was one of our highest voter turnout <laughs> uh, for a midterm election, which was fantastic. Uh, you know, we were out and about um, busy that day, but things overall went pretty smooth. Uh, when problems did arise, I think we were able to address them pretty quickly. And so I just want to say, uh, personally, I want to say thank you to all of the individuals who came out and worked on election day, volunteered on election day, and really help make sure it was successful. Hundreds of people come out to make sure that that's a success. Uh, so then the election results. So mm -hmm. we saw some changes, uh, both at our county commission. So Democrats picked up a couple seats. Um, the Senate seat flipped. And then obviously the governor, secretary of state, and AG uh, going into next year will be held by Democrats. Um, so for me, you know, uh, our, our priority at the city is still to identify policies that support not just our cities, but cities across the state and helps them be strong. So whether it's around economic development, public safety, mm -hmm. um, access to, to space, um, green space and, and public space, uh, you know, those will, housing, affordable housing, mm -hmm. all of those will continue to be a priority. My hope uh, is that as we look to a new administration that we're able to develop a really good working relationship with them to be both proactive and reactive. Uh, so reactive to policies that are put out there that we disagree with or support, but then also how do we work together to craft policy that is supportive of, of cities. Okay. So yeah, I'm optimistic, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it, it'll be interesting because Republicans still hold a majority in the House and the Senate, um, so it'll be a mix. I, th I think that is, uh, that will be a, an interesting challenge, I think, for our new governor. We're in what is... Uh commonly called a lame duck session oh. right now and there has been a flood of activity during yeah. that period of time. Yeah. Um, a couple notable ones had to do with uh, what we discussed last month, the public rights of ways and a little bit of what had typically been um, territory that local control yeah. kind of governed. That's changing yeah. as well as uh, some minimum wage and um, sick time, family yeah. leave information. Just tell a little bit about some of your perspectives on each of those. Yeah, so lame duck is a really interesting time. I was actually in Lansing last week on Wednesday or Thursday and um, had some meetings and then was at the Capitol. Uh, and, and there's a flurry of bills that are being pushed through uh, that, in my opinion, aren't good for our community and really aren't good for a lot of communities. So a lot of them in opposition to what voters kind of uh, expressed to be this, uh, the desire of yeah. the citizens. So you have a whole host of, of bills being pushed. Um, whether it is around 
uh, minimum wage, sick leave, some of the recommended changes to the recreational marijuana that just passed, um, some of the bills that are coming out that will limit the power of the governor and the AG um, and Secretary of State. Uh, so, so there's concerns about that for a whole host of reasons. Um, one, you know, philosophically not supporting the will of the people and the voters. Mm -hmm. But then there's a, there's a number of other bills that have come out that are concerning to us. So there was a bill that passed out of the Senate last week, which would uh, would limit and, and uh, remove local control around having a tree ordinance. Uh, which is important to us in many cities because we want green infrastructure and we want an urban canopy. Uh, and so that's a, another preemption bill that's being pushed. It came out of Senate. It's not now in the House. Uh, you probably read about some of the bills coming out that would allow for development on wetlands, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of wetlands throughout the state of Michigan. Um, so there's concerns about that. The small cell legislation basically would um, take away local control to manage um, the, the polls in our rights of way. Uh, and that's actually been in the works for a number of years and it looks like they're trying to push it through during lame duck. There's another one that would be a preemption bill for local government around um, short-term rentals. Uh, that too has been talked about for the last couple of years and there's concern that they're gonna try to push that through. Um, we know that the governor has some priorities around tipping fees and shoring up funds for Brownfield, um, which we need funds to be able to clean up contaminated sites. Uh, and so there's just, there's a flurry of activity in Lansing that's kind of hard to stay on top of, um, which is unfair to uh, the community, quite frankly, because sometimes people don't know about something until after the fact. So it's really hard to get the word out about some type of legislation if it's gonna be detrimental. So we're doing our best uh, to be in Lansing every day and, mm -hmm. and make the case and um, be present and know what's going on and then also get the word out about, especially with our, our network. Um, so the environmental bills, we're working really closely with the LCV, and so you've, you find your allies and try to band together to either support something or oppose something. It's crazy though. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a weird system that we, we have this lame duck period where you have yeah. people making decisions who are termed out and um, as some would say, you know, there's not a lot of accountability because they're leaving was actually watching online the votes and all that was happening on Wednesday having to do with that uh, Senate bill 637 I believe it is that has to do with the small cells and it was uh, had a, about 12 seconds it took to do a second reading vote and about 20 minutes later it was another 12 seconds to do the third and like that it passed so yeah. things happening that quickly and when yeah. you've got a flurry of things that also include uh, same day the things with uh, minimum wage and uh, sick leave yeah. uh, it's uh, really hard to mo uh, mobilize and really have an effect. So yeah. all these things now go into the governor's desk. Yeah. Any yeah. hope there? I I'm always hopeful, okay. you know. I, I think, um, I think the, the governor has an opportunity to obviously veto some of this legislation. Mm -hmm. I know people are already calling on his office to do that. He also has a number of priorities that he's trying to get through before he leaves. Uh, and so it's, it's just a really mm -hmm. interesting time uh, and you know, I always encourage people to the best of their ability, stay abreast of what's happening, and then mm -hmm. pick up the phone and call your elected officials. Uh, you know, not everyone is termed out. There's a whole host of folks mm -hmm. still in the Senate and the House who are going to be back there next year, and they need to hear from you. Very good. Um, yeah. Good information there. You, wa uh, you mentioned a little bit about wetlands and water is a big topic during mm -hmm. this last election. Yeah. Do you serve still on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence? Remind me of what the name yeah, of that is. Yeah, Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaways. I, you know, I don't. Okay. So we're still a member. Okay. So we still support the work. Um, my predecessor, Mayor Hartwell, served on the board. Uh, and when I became mayor, uh, quite frankly, there were, a, a, there were so many things I was already on that mm -hmm. I had to really take a fresh look at my priorities and be singularly focused on the city until I, you know, kind of got my feet under me as, as sure. mayor. Um, so it's very likely uh, next year, probably late next year, because um, my re-election campaign is next year. So after that, I'll get re-engaged probably at a much more um, detailed level. Grand Rapids having a, uh, a river at its heart. Uh, mm -hmm. Water is very, very important. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the priorities in our region when it comes to water. Yeah, so I mean, water quality is always the most important one. So mm -hmm. that continues to be a top, top priority of ours. 
uh, and we work really hard to do that. You know, we have a larger system, wastewater and water system. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of partner communities, so we're consistently working on that. How do we make sure that we're using waste? I'm really excited about the biodigester project, uh, and moving that forward, we'll be able to take some of the waste that's being generated locally and turn it into energy. Um, and we're working actually with DTE to create renewable natural gas, which can be used right here in Grand Rapids. Uh, before that's converted into electricity. So that helps offset the cost of that investment at the biodigester. So that's a really exciting project um, that we're working on. But then, you know, in addition to the water quality, we are very committed to looking at ways that we can reduce runoff into the river, which adds pollutants to the river. And that's why this green infrastructure is so critical. Because if you invest in green infrastructure instead of gray infrastructure, you can prevent a lot of those contaminants even getting into the waterway to begin with. Um, and so, we, so we have a very holistic approach. We have a great team at the city. I have a, a sustainability advisory committee that um, is really helping us. It's made up of experts throughout the community and we get together every other month and we're talking about these issues. Okay, yeah. I wanted to ask something I read and I didn't quite understand, so maybe you can fill us in a little bit, but uh, racial equity impact assessment um, some sort of a presentation or demo related to the um, Whitewater River Restoration Project. Is that something that uh, you can maybe tell us a little bit about? Is it related to the River for All Project? Um, I don't know, so yeah. we can skip this okay. one. Let's skip I, that. I, I probably can't speak uh, to that. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, what I saw, I believe, was an invitation to learn a little bit more about it, but um, might be a little premature on that yeah. one. We did have, though, last week, and I don't know if this is related to it, we um, brought in a group from the Bronx River Alliance last week. So there was a team from the Bronx here, and they had an event last week talking about the work that they did as they created the Bronx River Alliance. Okay. And um, that work and what they did in the Bronx, which is really fascinating, uh, they, on the very front end of that project, they did a lot of work to be intentional, to build in racial equity and to look at disparate outcomes along the Bronx. Now, it's a different river system, it's much longer, you know, it has different elements to it. It's, it's a lot of the work they were doing was around cleanup and on the, on the banks of the river. Uh, but there's a lot that we can learn from them and their early learnings from the work that they've been doing. And so they, they were here last week. I met with them individually a couple times and then they did a community event that was really fantastic. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, we're gonna take our first break and we're gonna welcome back to the studio after our break, uh, Ryan Verwiss. He's president and CEO of Inner City Christian Federation. We'll be right back with City Connection after this break. want to meet Santa Claus? Come to Santa's show live held at Wealthy Theater on Monday, December 10th from 5 to 6 p.m. Bring the family for an interactive event. Santa's looking forward to meeting you for the holidays. For more information, check out Santa Event Live on Facebook. Hope to see you guys there. We all want children to be happy and healthy and successful, don't we? But for half of the children of single mom families, that isn't going to happen. They live in poverty, they're hungry, and because of that, they can't focus on school. Their MSTEP scores prove it. Hi, I'm Carla Ludwig, founder and CEO of Hope for Single Moms. With your help, we can change this. Hope for Single Moms helps single moms by paying living and daycare expenses. These are their two greatest barriers to either getting a career education or finishing colleges. You can become part of our single mom success story by becoming member of her dream team with a monthly donation of $25 or more. But you know, it takes more than money for these women to be successful. That's why at Hope for Single Moms, we also provide a network of support, including a mentor. In fact, women with mentors are twice as likely to finish their education as those who don't have one. Are you interested in being part of our second family, but maybe you're not sure what to do? We will give you guidelines on how to do that. 
call or email us. Hope for Single Moms also next works with area social services like Michigan Works and Goodwill. These organizations are not able to assist their clients with daycare expenses, and Michigan has one of the highest daycare costs in the country at $500 a month. You can help these moms and children by donating to our daycare scholarship fund. So here's some questions I'd like you to think about. Do you want to leave the world a better place by helping women and children? Do you want to empower these women to financial stability? Do you want children to be happy, healthy, and successful in school and in life? You know, for every dollar you invest in these families, there is a potential $4 return to society. How? There is a decrease in their dependence on social services and an increase in taxes paid when these moms get a better paying job. And when their children are no longer hungry, they can do better in school. And then they too have a better Hello and welcome back. I'm really glad to have with me um, one of our key partners at the city um, in the work that we're doing around low income and affordable housing. So if you haven't met him yet, uh, Ryan Verweiss is the president and CEO of ICCF, which stands for Inner City Christian Foundation. Right? Did I get federation. that right? Federation. Federation. Uh, oh, thank you for correcting me. Everyone's like, I don't even know what federation is. Federation. Frankly, but it's a federation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but everyone refers to it as ICCF. Yeah. Um, so Ryan just reminded me that he's going into his fourth year in this yeah. position. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about you and what brought you here. Yeah. Um, people who are not familiar with ICCF, maybe we can talk a little bit about the whole scope of the work that you do in mm -hmm. the community, and then we can get into the issue around um, shelter, low-income housing, affordable housing, yeah. uh, and the work that you're doing, and the role, the really important role you're playing in our community. Thanks. Well, yeah. thank you so much for having me today. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. and. Uh, just so grateful for your work in the city, and so it's great to, to be here with you Thanks. tonight. Thank yeah. you. So, for people who don't know you, uh, you've been in this position four years. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey before that and what sure. brought you here? So, I, my journey before that really starts in Honduras. I had the chance to study in Honduras when I was in my undergrad uh, at Calvin College. And when I learned about the, the brokenness in the world, I wanted to be a part of being a part of making it uh, whole again and having it reflect justice that I believe that I'm a person of faith and I have this belief that God wants our community to be just. And so I came back from Honduras wondering how can I be a part of advancing that here in my own uh, country. And so I married my wife, Rachel. Uh, we're both social work students and uh, mm -hmm. right after getting married, we moved out to Southern California where we worked to help start a nonprofit that was oriented toward trying to end homelessness in our city. Now, there were about 100 folks who were living on the streets in our city, and we went to work connecting them with housing and employment, and uh, things were going really well and enjoyed that. And then uh, about four years ago, my wife and I uh, felt like we were called to come back here. I went to work with a, a family of churches here in the area called the Christian Reformed Church. I was a director of operations for a church planting agency for about a year before I took my, my role at ICCF uh, as CEO in uh, September of 2015. Nice. And, and before we jump to ICCF, I should mm -hmm. say, um, your wife is pretty amazing as well. Yeah. And she's very active in our community, particularly around human trafficking. That's right. My wife, Rachel, is part of a group called Solutions to End Exploitation, trying to build uh, solutions around this human trafficking problem that yeah. many of us don't even realize we have. Yeah. Um, it's a hidden problem in our community. Yeah, it's important work. I appreciate yeah. her leadership She's an amazing on that. woman, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, you're biased. <laughs> I, I, I'm biased, but I'm right, too. You so. are right, yeah. <laughs> um, so, ICCF, for people who are not sure. familiar with ICCF, I know some people probably drive by your beautiful building, uh, the old Dave yeah. Blodgett Home for Children, That's there right. on Cherry Street. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about not, I mean, not just the work that you do out of sure. that building, you are all over this community. Yeah, ICCF is a faith-based housing organization that's been working here in Grand Rapids since 1974. So if you think of what our community was like in 74, we were grappling with some big issues of racial injustice yeah. around employment, uh, treatment of police, uh, treatment of people by police, and then also housing. Uh, housing discrimination was rampant and people were fed up with it and there was a, a real uprising in our community. And in response, 
uh, people from local churches said, how can we be a part of advancing justice around housing in our community? And so some volunteers at the Eastern Avenue Christian Reform Church took a donated house, fixed it up, sold it to a low-income family, and that really started what now is ICCF um, so many years ago. Uh, and in the, in the intervening time, we've impacted the community broadly, but we really focus on three key areas. One is demonstrating a respectful compassion. We know that when it, as it relates to housing, unfortunately, so many people are falling through the cracks right now as there's a housing shortage, income hasn't kept up with the um, the rate of housing prices and rents, and so we find far too many of our neighbors are ending up homeless. And so we have a shelter called Family Haven that for the last 27 years has served as a place to demonstrate respectful compassion for people who are in that difficult uh, position of being on the streets. So five families at a time can stay with us. Uh, we help them uh, get housed as rapidly as possible in stable housing. So that's the first part of our work. Second is a restorative development. We don't believe that anybody should be defined by their crisis or by a situation that they're in. So everyone who has, everyone has gifts, talents, responsibilities, and we count it a privilege to come alongside our neighbors and help them expand their skill set around financial capabilities, help them learn the basics of what it would be to be a homeowner someday, and then really try and help people achieve their, their dreams and goals by helping really encourage them and identify those, those resources that are out there to help them achieve success. And then the third area, which we're probably most known for is the creation of inclusive housing. Uh, so in a market like we're in right now, there's all sorts of vitality um, as it relates to housing. I just saw a report this week that uh, truly lists us as the second highest or second hottest market uh, poised country. for takeoff in the country, right behind yeah. Colorado Springs. So as a homeowner, that's exciting, right? We believe that there's some real, um, there's value, vitality in this community. But as a community, we also hold this, this ideal, I believe, that we want to be a place of inclusion, that people are not going to be priced out of a community that they've lived in for a long time as those rents and home values go up. So ICCF creates not only a multifamily rental housing, um, as we're building throughout the city right now, but also we're still working toward creating home ownership opportunities for low-income buyers. Yeah. So you have um, a number of really great projects right now. I should I should say before I jump to that, mm -hmm. I read the article in Trulia and mm -hmm. um, it really is a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's good in many respects and then it exacerbates a problem that we're already struggling with when it comes to affordable housing. Yeah. Um, and so it is, it's that, it's the challenge and the complexity of the work that we do around housing. Right. So as we see success in our yeah. community coming back from the recession, we celebrate that, but we also know that it takes intentionality in a market like this to make sure that people who've lived in neighborhoods, many of whom have had experienced oppressive disinvestment over the years by yeah. bank policies and federal policies, um, that as neighborhoods see that investment return, that people can stay if yeah. they want to. Yeah, which you're having a part of. Uh, so let's talk about two, I think, important things. One, mm -hmm. you have a number of great projects that uh, recently you broke ground on, one being mm -hmm. right here around the corner yeah. um, from where we stand at the Community Media Center on the west side. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing great projects really in, in every uh, quadrant of the city, I should say. Mm -hmm. And then also you um, have been working with a number of key partners around homes mm -hmm. and you worked really hard to secure funding to, to get 177 properties in the city and you're now working at um, turning those around. So feel free to talk about either sure. one. Um, well, both I'll, are important. I'll share first the, the multifamily. So we're building yeah. a couple of apartment buildings in the city that are going to be beautiful homes, places where people who have low incomes are going to be able to stay. Uh, so one is right here on the west side, yeah. Stockbridge Apartments. That will be 64 units of, of apartments, 13 market rate, 51 units of uh, apartments that are affordable to people at or below 60% of the area median income. So affordable, we mean we're really trying to get people to spend no more than 30% of their, yeah. their income on housing. Then the others on the uh, southeast side, 501 Eastern, right across from the street from the church that really helped start ICCF. Mm -hmm. uh, we're building 65 apartments there. Really cool thing there is 17 of those apartments will be for youth who've experienced homelessness or at risk of homelessness. Yeah. And uh, we really want to help them 
have an affordable place. And then the Community Homes Initiative is that an, uh, initiative you mentioned where we purchased 177 properties uh, with the goal of keeping them affordable, helping make them more green. Uh, a lot of the homes we bought were drafty, had old windows and leaky roofs, and we're coming in, we're making improvements right away. Uh, and our ultimate goal is to sell 50% of those homes to low-income buyers over the next 10 years. Yeah, which is great. Yeah. I should add one other property uh, over in my former neck of the woods, and that is yeah. the old Eastern School. Yeah. So you're also um, working on that project. We're working right now to get all the financing lined up for the Eastern yeah. Elementary School. Yeah, uh, yeah. Exciting project that will bring about 50 units of uh, housing, workforce housing, low-income housing, uh, we really love to build mixed income housing wherever we can because we really think that combats the pattern of isolation that we've seen far too often in communities where people live, um, oftentimes those who are low income are pushed out uh, and we really think, we believe that should be at the center of uh, what we do. Yeah, And then uh, probably about a year ago uh, you did the uh, ribbon cutting for Tapestry Square. Yeah. Another really great uh, project that ICCF took the lead on off of wealthy and division and again having units available for kids aging out of foster care. Yeah, so in that 24 unit apartment complex, there's commercial on the main floor, so there's a couple of businesses going in there actually right now. And then above are a mix apartments with a mix of income. So six of the units there are set aside for youth who've aged out of foster care. So in our system, you know, you're a yeah. social worker, you turn 18 in the foster care system, you're emancipated and expected to really live without much of any support network. Yeah. And uh, these homes are called, uh, come with what's called permanent supportive housing. So the youth have an affordable place to live, but then the support services come right to where the youth are living. It's not a group home. They have independence. They get to live on their own, uh, but the social workers can come in and check on uh, the residents, make sure that any barriers they might be facing to get into work on time or any educational goals that they're aiming for, they can achieve those goals with those extra supports. Yeah, I love that. I love that program. Yeah. Um, and then going back to the 177 yeah. properties, some people may wonder, how did you get them? Where did oh, they come sure. from? Um, so it was really a unique opportunity that you were able to take advantage of. So during the downturn of the economy, there were a lot of outside investors who saw the hotness of our market and wanted to get in uh, on the ground floor of a recovery. And a, uh, one of those investors, uh, we found out, was selling their whole portfolio of homes that they had bought, uh, distressed properties. Uh, and we thought, man, wouldn't it be great if somebody with a heart for our community were to buy these homes? And then it worked out that because of uh, community partners, philanthropic supporters, uh, lenders who have a heart for what we do, who gave us uh, generous lending um, terms, uh, and we were able to acquire those, those homes last year at this time. And uh, so now we're in the work of, of building the, renovating the homes. We've renovated almost 100% of the homes in the last awesome. year. So our team is working really hard, yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. But we really are excited to have that as part of the solution to the affordable housing need in our community. Yeah, well that's a great note to end on um, because the work that you do doesn't happen uh, on your own. You have a mm. lot of partners that help you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, I think that is a perfect example of it. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to take a break, and then we'll be back for some Q&A with Ryan. Why do local businesses spend their marketing dollars with Community Media Center? Because it's more than just passive advertising. It is an investment in the community that is eager to invest in you. The Community Media Center makes Grand Rapids vital. We collaborate with local businesses and support events in West Michigan. Inclusive. We amplify local voices that tell the diverse and ever-changing stories of our community. Creative. We encourage artists to showcase and expand their talents and to shape the look and sound of Grand Rapids. Marketing with the CMC will let our community know who you are and increase brand recognition for your business. 
At the end of the day, we are a resource that will keep you connected to the community. Share your message with diverse audiences by underwriting with WYCE, GRTV, Wealthy Theater, and The Rapidian. Join us in building a stronger community through media. Contact us at marketing at grcmc.org. Did you know there's a community event that is designed to connect you to your neighborhood? That brings together local resources for interactive learning. The Neighbor Knowledge Exchange, hosted by Dwelling Place in the Heartside neighborhood, is just that. Last year, the Neighbor Knowledge Exchange brought together 189 neighbors and 17 organizations in an open house style event. This year, we've added hands-on workshops, raffle prizes, and new community connections so you can grow with your neighborhood. So if you're neighbor focused, or new to the area, a Dwelling Place resident, a community gardener, a social worker, an artist, a small business owner, or if you live and work in Heartside, you're invited to join Dwelling Place at the Neighbor Knowledge Exchange. This event will take place on Thursday, January 31st from 3 to 7 p.m. at 106 South Division. And we need volunteers. If you want to help, email Dwelling Place, volunteers at dwellingplacegr.org, or follow the event on Facebook. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in January. City Connection here on Community Media Center's GRTV Live Wire Channel 24. With Mayor Bliss here in the studio, we now have sitting with us uh, Ryan Verwiss with ICCF. We've learned so much, but a few more questions. And when we were just off air, there was a subject you wanted to bring up and maybe talk a little bit more about. The two of you were talking about uh, some emergency shelter type uh, facilities and what's been happening recently there. Yeah. I think I'll have Ryan talk sure. about that. He's been in the trenches in this work now, uh, having the community conversations about how we solve this. So as I mentioned earlier, with the hot housing market and the incredible increase in home prices in our community, um, far too many families have found themselves on the fringe or uh, falling through the cracks. And recently, uh, a tool that we've used as a community to serve families that are in that situation, a hotel voucher program, mm -hmm. ran out of money uh, earlier than we had expected. Mm -hmm. And so several of us in the community, we have a really strong um, nonprofit sector working around this issue of housing and homelessness. Several of us got together and said, how can we uh, mitigate this crisis? And uh, so tonight there's a community listening event going on at the Fulton Manor. It's a, a facility owned and operated by Holland Home for many years as a place for seniors to live. Uh, they had uh, been transitioning out of that building and as they heard about the, the crisis and as several of us in the nonprofit sector we're trying to figure out an, an, a short-term solution to this crisis. They offered uh, to have that as a place where families could stay. And so we'll be going before the Planning Commission mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks to uh, apply for a speci special land use. And then uh, Family Promise, which is one of our partner groups, is hoping to, to facilitate that, um, that place as a place for families to stay temporarily during this time. Yeah. It sounds like a huge community of partner organizations mm -hmm. that make this all happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that would, um, so, th so the special land use, because it's a different type of use, that's why there needs to be approval from the city for that temporary use. But my understanding is it would house potentially 76 um, individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be a, a, a significant help right now mm -hmm. as we really struggle to find emergency shelter for families. You said that would be a somewhat short term. How long are you thinking? The initial plan is really for a year. Um, there are several housing resources that will be coming online, including not just ICCF Homes, but Link, uh, Dwelling Place, Genesis Nonprofit Housing. There are several affordable units that should be coming online in the next year. And our hope is that will help 
to alleviate some of that pressure. Um, and then uh, great news, I don't know if you had heard last <coughs> week, but uh, Community Rebuilders was given a, a generous award from uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are a lot of factors that are um, pointing in the right direction, I think. But in the short term, we have families right now that are on the streets and nobody wants that to happen. And so it really felt providential as this uh, Holland Home facility was it's built already, it's heated already, and it's really a potentially a, a great place to address this issue for the short term. Okay. Well, housing is really at the forefront in so many ways, and uh, Mayor, it was a couple years ago that you really brought that to be a priority during your mm -hmm. term, and uh, it's coming to fruition. The need is even growing yeah. and growing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so curious about the what happens when you have a um, mixed housing uh, unit when it is um, affordable housing and low income housing and market rate and I just want to know a little bit about the not that it's a social experiment but just what that does to quality of life for people you would kind of talk just briefly about it about not kind of uh, segmenting people but tell mm -hmm. a little bit more about what you see anecdotally anecdotally. Part of what we believe, I mean, the motivation for us goes to our core value of respect and beauty. Uh, we believe that all people, uh, regardless of their income, want to live in a place that is full of opportunity, that's beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, where they can connect with their neighbors. And far too often, historically, just because of the way that free markets work, um, unfortunately, those who are lower income or income constrained find themselves forced to be in places of isolation. And so, uh, we've, we've been really excited uh, to offer mixed income housing in an area that's experiencing a great deal of interest. So right near wealthy and division, there's a lot of interest from the market. Uh, so market rate housing in that area is going pretty, pretty quickly and at, for high prices. Um, so there's high demand and it's really great to be able to offer residents, especially those who are low income and income constrained, to be able to live in that place of vital opportunity uh, near the bus lines, near the downtown. Uh, and I think it really, one of it is expands, I think it improves life for everyone, not just for low income families. Oftentimes people think of ICCF as serving just low income families, but really I believe a healthy community is a place where people of, of all walks of life have the opportunity to live and thrive, and that that really improves everyone's life, not just those low income families, uh, but those who are maybe think they've got it all put together, uh, who realize maybe they don't have it all put together. Maybe they're isolated too, and there's, there's a need for community regardless of what your income level is. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, um, it's very much aligned with our vision as a city, right? We want mixed income, mixed housing in every single neighborhood, uh, and, that, and, and diversity, and that's where you get vibrant, rich, connected, neighborhoods and community and so it's very much aligned with our overarching vision as a city mm -hmm. to have mixed income mixed housing everywhere okay interesting yeah. tell me a little bit about the efforts that as you acquire new housing and as you build new housing that what it is you, that you do to assure that others aren't being displaced it's mm. a good question well um for us, we feel like our lane is to preserve and create as much affordable housing as we can. Um, there's not much we can do about controlling the free market. <laughs> uh, so we are doing everything we can to create as much affordable housing, both rental and home ownership, as we can in, in this time. That's why we're so excited about this Community Homes Initiative, where we purchased this portfolio of homes. It really gives us the opportunity to help families who, if they were to try and go into the open housing market and buy a starter home, they're just going to have a really tough time competing with cash buyers from out of state, people who can come in and buy things sight unseen mm -hmm. and flip things. We're, we're excited to be able to offer these homes now um, over the next 10 years at a pace that families who are maybe not ready to buy today, but maybe a year from now, uh, will be able to begin to build generational wealth. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that uh, was just in the news this week, we're, we're going to be starting something called the Community Homes Land Trust which is a, an innovative way to really help families who can't afford a market rate home right now to be able to buy a home, but also then to preserve the affordability of that home for the next generations to come. So helping low-income families build wealth by uh, getting into home ownership and building equity, but also for the community, preserving these homes as affordable homes for years to come.
Do you have some methodology or some techniques when it comes to uh, turning these into home ownership versus rental? I mean, is it a reduced mortgage opportunity? Is it building equity while you're a renter? Tell a little bit about how your program works. So the Community Homes Land Trust uh, utilizes something called a, a shared equity model. So uh, if the home appraised at $100,000 today, which many of these homes, it's actually it's harder and harder to mm -hmm. find a home anywhere in Grand Rapids for 100000 yeah. or less. But let's use 100000 for um, sake of discussion. If it was appraised at 100000 today, we would sell that home at 80000 to the low-income buyer. And then what we have is an agreement on the equity share or the, uh, pr the share of appreciation going forward. So let's say 10 years down the road, that home has doubled in value. Now it's 200000 um, The agreement up front says we would share 25% of the appreciation with that family. So the family's building equity as they pay off their mortgage, just like that's really mostly how most of us build equity is paying down our mortgage over time. But then they get a portion of that uh, appraised value uh, as it's, it's gone up. Um, what that allows us to do is to take that 75% and keep it with the home so that when that home is sold the next time, 10 years later, it's only the purchase price of that initial buyer plus the 25%. So it keeps those homes attainable for low-income buyers going forward. Okay. So those homes are always sold in that sort of way? Always sold to a low-income buyer, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then I want to ask you a little bit about with the uh, apartment complexes that you're building and then this acquisition of 177 pieces of property, what is your balance of uh, multifamily uh, dwellings and individual dwellings that are for home ownership? Uh, scattered site. Well, so we have uh, just over 400 units of affordable housing broadly, and some of that is... Um, in multifamily developments. Um, so that number is all rental right now. Our goal is to sell 50% of those 177 over the next 10 years. Uh, the other tool that we use though to help with home ownership is really in partnership with the city mm -hmm. uh, through a program called the Home Fund. Um, sorry, it's Home Fund, it's a HUD <laughs> program <laughs> HUD. Yeah. that allows us to acquire a rundown home, invest funds in, in renovating that home and then selling it to a loan income buyer. Uh, that's been another tool that we've continued to use. So we're working on some houses actually up in uh, Cedar Springs right now in partnership with the county uh, utilizing that same program. Yeah. How big is your reach? I was just going to ask, ICCF is reaching up to Cedar Springs. How big is the reach? Well, so our, our focus has always been on the southeast side. That's kind of where our heart is. That's where we were born as an organization. But we work certainly within the city of Grand Rapids is the majority of our work and then Kent County more broadly. Um, so we work with the county to build some homes. We've done some out in Lowell, um, Cedar Springs, City of Wyoming. Bulk of our housing though is in, in Grand Rapids City proper. Okay. Well, were you going to add something? I was, I was just going to add, um, we we have worked really closely with a number of nonprofits, especially ICCF, and um, just recently the City Commission approved um, an additional 16 homes that will be working with our nonprofit organizations. Their homes that were foreclosed on mm -hmm. that we were able to purchase. Uh, and we're working on clearing title right now, and then we'll work with the nonprofits to redevelop those using federal dollars. So home dollars are federal dollars that are allocated to us, and then we utilize those to support housing in the community with our nonprofit partners. But we've done we've done other things as well. We uh, city commission has a, a, a down payment assistance program for low income families, and we increased the amount of that down payment assistance probably about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, so again, as, as issues come up and as we hear from the community what we can do to be helpful, we are taking a look at what we can do to support the work of um, the nonprofit sector as well. Okay. And as a way of wrapping up, what about maybe a website or, or how do people kind of maybe make application to become a part of what's going on and, and to find some low-income housing? So if you're in immediate need of housing, I'd encourage you to call 211. We have a centralized service where people will answer that call, help you if you're in a, an immediate need of housing, they'll help you identify whatever resources are immediately available. Um, beyond that, to learn more about ICCF, go to our website, iccf.org. Uh, you can learn more about our housing programs, our education programs. Uh, another program I want to mention is our individual development account program that really helps people who are saving toward home ownership by incentivizing savings with a, a three to one match for a down payment. So mm -hmm. it goes with city down payment assistance and MISHTA, Michigan State Housing Development Authority assistance programs. It really um, helps people get into that home ownership. Great. 
Ryan Verweiss with the Inner City Christian Federation. Thanks for joining us on City Connection Thank today. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you very much. And after this break, uh, Mayor Roslyn Bliss and I will be right back. for the community provides an alternative. To be the eyes of somebody who's not there. It's more honest, more authentic, and more true. And you do have the freedom to talk about things because they're things that need to be talked about, not because they'll get readers or viewers or clicks. Sometimes it feels intimidating to write a news story or, or to write a story about a, a community issue. What I love about the Rapidian is that they make it really simple and easy. So it's not like you have to meet this deadline by this time. I'll be eating a sandwich in one hand and then I'm like typing in the other. I love the freedom to be able to write from wherever. I think it's a really powerful experience when people are able to tell their story and to be heard. Anyone can have a voice. Anybody can speak. It's a platform for the community to tell its own story in a very authentic way and that's powerful. The community has to be involved in order for it to be sustainable and so it tells you something about our community. WYCE is a world of music. We aim to shine a light on underserved musical artists in a non-commercial format with no advertisements. Volunteers come in to create personalized music programming that broadcasts over the air at 88.1 FM to West Michigan and via the internet to listeners all over the world. These listeners sponsor our efforts, keeping WYCE independent and community owned. Musicians use the station to broaden their audience and build support for their latest projects by submitting their music to be included in our broadcast and performing live in studio. Businesses find their customers through underwriting, nonprofits inform the community to their mission, and listeners stay informed about local events. We believe that music is a powerful force that creates quality relationships in our community, that speaks to our emotions, and provides the soundtrack to our lives. Connection here on GRTV's Livewire Channel 24 in the studio here with Mayor Roslyn <coughs> Bliss and we're just going to cover a few more city related topics yeah. while we've got a bit of time. Um, last thing we were just talking about before we uh, came back from break is Vision Zero and it has yes. to do with um, safety program related yeah. to pedestrians and yeah. cyclists. Yeah so it was probably about uh, 10 days ago we talked about the results of our initiative to educate the community about safety both um, for drivers and pedestrians and cyclists and it was it was uh, an initiative that was started um, probably about two years ago in response to crash data that indicated that Grand Rapids had one of the highest bicycle car crash um, rates in the state uh, and so that was a, a really significant uh, initiative of ours we had a lot of partners um, worked with MDOT, we got some grants, did this very comprehensive education uh, campaign. And then uh, uh, last year, we tied in additional education and partnership with all of the uh, companies that uh, train new drivers, talking to, to them about embedding into their curriculum education about pedestrian safety and bicycle safety. We changed some of our ordinances, so you may have noticed that at crosswalks, it changed from yield to stop. Uh, and then we've, we've done a lot of education with a number of partners. And then the really cool thing is that we worked with Western and they identified a team that rode around on their bikes with these um, gadgets, I should say, uh, that measured how far cars were away from them, so how much distance cars were giving cyclists. And that was related to an ordinance that we changed where um, we 
changed our bicycle ordinance and said that drivers had to give five feet distance to cyclists. So then we wanted to see if there was, if that was actually happening. So it had a number of different components. Uh, and what we found is that there was a significant reduction in both bicycle and pedestrian crashes. Uh, and so there was a lot of success. We still have more work to do. Um, I think the key findings though, is that it has to be a comprehensive approach, right? We need drivers, cyclists, people on scooters, skateboards, um, pedestrians to all know the rules of the road to make sure that it's safe for everyone, right? So if you're a pedestrian, go to the crosswalk where it's safest to cross. If you're a cyclist, know what side of the street that you need to be on. Know that you have to, you know, follow the rules of the road and if it's a stoplight, you have to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was a big part of our campaign. And is that really what was at the heart of it with just uh, a little bit of the ordinance and the regulations yeah. just uh, not adhering to them? I mean, we, want, yeah. we get end up being special in a lot of ways, but we don't yeah. want to be special here in Grand Rapids for that kind of reason. Exactly. You know, you know I think it was probably multi, um, multi-pronged, right? You needed the rules and the regulations, um, you needed the education and the awareness, and then you need enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think that's why the campaign was so successful is because it really touched on all of these different elements and it brought together a lot of partners. Next steps? Yeah, next steps. So we're going to continue on okay. um, with the education and the awareness and the enforcement. Uh, and then we're looking at ways to really beef up and make sure that we're getting especially to those young drivers. Okay. Yeah. All right, next subject, uh, GRPD inviting the community to learn a little bit about something called Cure Violence. A yes. couple opportunities uh, in the next few days. I think it's the 10th and the 12th of this week. Yeah. Yeah, so Cure Violence, it's a uh, evidence-based uh, violence prevention program. We've been talking about it actually um, around the city commission table uh, for a couple years now. Our safe task force talked about it. Um, I feel very strongly that we need to, to uh, have an evidence-based violence prevention program. So Cure Violence is, is one of those programs. Uh, so we, probably about three months ago, the city commission uh, is working in partnership with some experts in Cure Violence to do some education in the community, but also to get some community feedback uh, and figure out, you know, do we wanna move forward with this model? And then what do we need to do to make it really unique and meet the needs of Grand Rapids? Um, it works and is working in many other communities, but as you know, mm -hmm. every community is different. And so we wanna make sure that um, as we look at moving forward with implementation of even a pilot, so probably a two or three year pilot of an evidence-based uh, violence prevention program, we wanna make sure that it's really meeting the needs of our city. So if somebody were to attend next week, either yeah. on the 10th or the 12th, and uh, what, would, what would be a part of that? Yeah. Is it a presentation, is it interactive, what happens? Yeah, I, my understanding is it's, is it's both. Okay. So there will be an overview of what it is, um, data and what other cities have learned, and then there will be some feedback opportunity and some community dialogue. Okay, so I found this on the city website. Others yes. can get the details. On the 10th, it's at Neyland Christian Reformed Church, and then on the 12th at the Croc Center. So yes. I'll get more information on attending yeah. that. One thing I saw happening that had a lot of response from people was this city uh, offered an opportunity to um, kind of go through Archives and Records Center and yes. do some research and uh, Apparently, that was very uh, sought after. Yeah, you know, I I don't know if you've have you have you ever been to our archives? No, they're amazing. You should go. Okay. So we have this um, archive center that is so rich with history and documents and pictures and um, there's so much information about the history of our city. And uh, probably about a year ago, we hired um, the gentleman who ran the archive center. He retired. We hired a new gentleman, um, Tony. Uh, really was is creative and thinking about how do we let more people know about this really amazing asset uh, but then also invite people to come in and see all of the work that we have and that coupled with the museum school so the museum school um, the students who go to the museum school in the old museum uh, they those kids have access to the archives so they can use the archives as part of their learning experience. Um, so I think, I think between having somebody new in the center, having the museum school really take a look at how do we use archives um, in a way to teach about history, especially history right here in Grand Rapids. Uh, we have this desire to educate the community. So there were these open houses uh, where people could come, but you can make an appointment. If you wanna go um, to the archive center and take a look, or if you have something you wanna research, um, you can just call the city and spend some time at the archives. Wow. They're amazing. You should go. Yeah, I'd, you should I'd, go. I'd, I'd, 
I, I have this picture in my mind, and I'm sure that's not what uh, it looks like, but I can see stacks of photos and boxes and all kinds of stuff. It's awesome. So I'll tell you, uh, when I first became city commissioner, I went a couple times, and uh, they had microfiche. Like, I remember I that. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't even know if 20-year-olds know what that is anymore. <laughs> but um, I remember from when I was a kid. But it was, it, I mean, just the picture. It's really amazing what we have. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Sounds you like a field go. trip. Yeah, <laughs> should be. A um, couple opportunities coming up. It's uh, open time again for uh, applying for the Neighborhood Match yes. Fund. A little bit of information on that. We've got this month to yeah. put in applications. Yeah, so if you have an idea about a project you want to do in your neighborhood, um, please look and you need some resources and some funds to do it. Um, there's an application on the city's website. We're taking applications for this month, um, the rest of this month, and then it'll be for awards given uh, early next quarter for projects done. I think, I think they need to be complete by um, early spring. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so take a look at that. There have been some really incredible projects, a lot of youth-driven projects. Um, but the, the application is really simple. And then if you have questions, we have a team that will help you walk through the application process. Uh, and then I should also add, we're in the work, we're uh, almost uh, teed up to, to get all the logistics out there, but we're working on the Neighborhood Summit, which will be in March. And so that's a full day event. Um, I believe we're gonna have it at Grand Valley State again, and we'll bring in a number of key speakers talking about the importance of strong neighborhoods and how do we get there. Excellent. Yeah. A um, couple other things that are going on. I think you said is it tomorrow that the City Commission is uh, doing sort of a strategic planning yeah. session open to the community to yeah. listen, watch? Yeah, All yes. Right. So our new city manager um, organized a strategic planning process, which is tomorrow afternoon from 1.30 to 5, I believe. Um, and he's bringing in a facilitator and he'll work with the commission to um, really prioritize um, priorities, kind of big mm -hmm. picture priorities to give him some direction moving into the budget process. Uh, and so we'll talk about vision, goals, priorities, uh, and then he'll take and synthesize that information. Uh, he's planning on doing some community feedback processes before he finalizes the budget. Uh, and then he'll be presenting the budget to the full city commission probably uh, first week of March. That's earlier than usual. It's earlier than usual. Yeah. Uh, typically, you're absolutely right, uh, and this came from um, some different opinions about our charter and when we have to approve the budget. Oh, okay. So yes. trying to be compliant where maybe it was uh, not seen the same way in the past. Right. Gotcha. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, a couple significant dates as we uh, certainly have left fall and we're into winter now. Um, yeah. It means uh, certain things about where you can park here in the city, and it also yeah. means that uh, the window is closing for removing yard waste and being able to drop it off. Yeah. So if you have any yard waste you can, and you live in the city, you can drop it off for free. It closes um, on December 15th. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and if you have yard waste bags that haven't been picked up, please let the city know so we can get out and pick those up. Uh, and then, yeah, please. Uh, take a look at odd even parking uh, and make sure you comply with that. It's very, very helpful for our snow plowers who are out working hard trying to clear those streets, especially after a heavy snow. Okay, and uh, even though we've not seen a whole lot of that, we will. Not on here. wood. That's it, not wood, it, but <laughs> right here, <laughs> we got this. <laughs> All right. Well, Mayor, we're due to be back at this on January 7th. We'll compare yeah. schedules, make sure we're beyond the holidays. But uh, first Monday of the month is City Connection. This is uh, Mayor Roslyn Bliss. I'm Linda Glash. We'll close out December's episode with uh, City Connection here on GRTV Livewire Channel 24.